And welcome, I'm Robert Breaker, and let's get into this today. We've got a lot to cover. We're going to be looking at the mark of the beast. What does the Bible say about this thing called the mark of the beast? I've had several people over the years ask me, would you do a video just on the mark of the beast? Um, I've talked about the mark of the beast before several times in other videos that I've made, but people wanted me to make a video just on this one subject. And there is so much information on this. If you go to YouTube, you'll find a lot of places on YouTube where people have already talked about this. And every day something new comes out in the news that, that looks like, wow, that lines up with the book of Revelation. So we're going to go to the book of Revelation today, chapter 13. We're going to look at the mark of the beast. Now we've been studying in times. And uh, several weeks ago we looked at uh, Israel. And I made a few videos about Israel and prophecy, Israel in the last days, the Jubilees. Uh, we looked at the, the tribulation period, Daniel's 70th week. And we looked at how a person who misses the rapture will have to come to Jesus in the tribulation period by not taking the mark of the beast. So let me write up here. This is what the Bible teaches, and this is where we'll be looking at today. And this is a, a subject that is... Not for Christians, okay? But you need to know what it is. So if you are a Christian, this is this is not doctrinally to you. You don't need to know if you're saved and you go at the rapture about this subject. But if you're left behind, then you need to know about this. So here's what the Bible teaches. I'll lay up the timeline like I do every week up here. Uh, here we've got what's called the Millennial Kingdom. That's the last thousand years. Here we have the church age, all right? The church ends at the rapture. After the rapture, after the church leaves, then comes what's called the tribulation period. Tribulation period will be seven years, and it's divided into half of three and a half and three and a half. And somewhere in there, and I'm, I'm leaning toward the middle, toward the end, so after three and a half years, they'll begin to give the mark of the beast. Now, I could be wrong. They could give the mark of the beast immediately after the rapture. I don't know, but it, from how I read the scriptures and from what I see, it looks like the mark of the beast is only in the last three and a half years and not before that. But again, I won't be there, so I don't know. <laughs> I'm in getting out at the rapture, so I won't be here. So what I'm going to be talking about today is what the Bible talks about will happen at this time after the rapture of the church. So if you're watching this and the rapture has not taken place yet, this is just something in the future you can put in the back of your mind and say, yeah, that's going to be for those people. If you're saved and you go at the rapture, it's not for you. Now, if you're watching this video and the rapture has taken place, then this will be something very important to listen to. And you need to understand, this is what the Bible says about this thing called the mark of the beast and what the Bible says you should or shouldn't do when it comes to this mark of the beast. So let's begin in the Mark of the Beast, studying what the Bible says about it. It's found several times in the book of Revelation, and we're going to go to chapter 13. This will be the time in which the Antichrist will reign. So the Antichrist will be alive in this time period, and he will be the one that tells people they must take the mark. It's his mark, the mark of the beast. Now the Antichrist is a man but he's also going to be Satan incarnate. So he's going to be Lucifer inhabiting the body of someone at the last three and a half years of the tribulation. So you've got to understand and know all these things. The world, the entire world, after the rapture, will go after this Antichrist and will worship him. And part of the thing that shows that you are worshiping is that you take this mark. So this is what the Bible says about it. And look, we're just going to look at Scripture. I, I wanted to go in detail and I figure, wow, that might take several hours. So sometimes the best thing to do is just give a simple presentation. So I'm just going to give you as simply as I can what the Bible says about this mark of the beast. I only have seven points. <laughs> this is my seven-point homiletical outline on the mark of the beast. You say, oh, but I'll go quickly. I'll go quickly. And this is just to be an informative video to inform what the mark of the beast is according to the scriptures, what the Bible says about it. So, starting here in Revelation chapter 13, we're going to read verses 1 through 6, then we're going to read verses 11 through 18. The Bible says, Revelation 13, 1, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horn ten crowns, and upon his heads the names are the name of blasphemy. 
Verse 2, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seed and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, Now we know the dragon is Satan, or the devil, or Lucifer, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. So there's a deadly wound. What, what this sounds like to me as I read the Bible is that there's what's called the, the man of sin, who's reigning for three and a half years as the Antichrist, who dies in the middle of that three and a half years. He has a deadly wound, but then he comes back to life. His deadly wound is healed, and he comes back to life. And this is when the dragon, or the Antichrist, um, resurrects. And that's when the devil is inside of him. It continues for 42 months. And as we continue reading in this passage, it looks like that's when the mark will be given in the last three and a half years. But like I said, they might even give it before that. I don't know. But uh, this is what it appears. This is my thinking before the rapture of what it could possibly be. Now... Verse 6, And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Okay, so now let's go to verse 11. And now verse 11 all the way down to verse 18 is where it begins to talk about the mark of the beast. So starting now in verse 11, all right, still in Revelation 13. Revelation 13, 11 through 18. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Again, a deadly wound. Well, that means you were wounded to death. That means you died. So he died, but somehow came back to life. Could it have been Satan incarnate coming back, resurrected inside? That's what many people believe. Verse 13, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, say to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. The Bible even tells us how he had that deadly wound. It was a sword. I remember years ago there was a movie on TV with uh, was it Kirk Douglas or someone like that, and it was all about end-timed events. It was about the Antichrist, and they didn't follow the Bible. They had the Antichrist being hit by the blade of a helicopter, and that was the deadly wound. But the Bible says it's a sword. Somehow he's wounded with a sword, and that's a deadly wound. Now, verse 15, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads. Verse 16. This is the mark of the beast that we'll be talking about today. Verse 17. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred threescore and six. All right? A, a score is 20. So 600, three score, all right, 23 times would be 60. So 666. So this is what the Bible is talking about when it talks about the mark of the beast. And it comes here during this time period. Now, the mark of the beast is three things. There's three things mentioned here. There's three parts to this thing. It says, he that hath the name or the number or the mark so when the antichrist takes over he's going to force people to take the mark of the beast but he's also he's got a number that he uses his number is 666 he's got a mark now we're going to look at that today what is that mark but he also has a name well do we know the name of the antichrist today i don't know i'm not sure it's very hard for me to say exactly who the Antichrist is. Some people think it's Barack Hussein Obama. And uh, you can go to Carl Gallup's and look up some of his stuff. that He, he shows that that man's name is in the Bible. <laughs> so some people thought that while he was president, and he's no longer president. But then again, he's wanting to become the head of the United Nations and other things. So could it be? I don't know. Other people think it's Prince William. 
Other people think it's this guy, Ergadon, or someone else. So there's a lot of candidates for who this Antichrist, who this beast could be. But we don't know his name. But we do know the number. And it says, here's wisdom. All right, if you want wisdom, you need to understand what the mark of the beast is. It's all about a number, 666. And we're seeing this number, 666, repeating over and over and over again. And the devil is using this number. This must be the devil's number. And the devil's going to make people get a mark. What I want to do today, I want to take you through um, seven different things that I looked at and I found just as I was reading through all this again. I just came out with seven different things that I want to show you about this thing. So the mark of the beast, the first thing I want to say about the mark. Number one, the mark is a physical thing. It is a physical thing given to someone in a specific place. I have to state this because there are people today, when you talk about the mark of the beast, that if I remember right, they call themselves the Seventh-day uh, denomination. These people come along and they tell you that the mark of the beast is this or that or the other thing, or it's a system, or it's, uh, they even go so far as to say the mark of the beast is going to church on a Sunday. <laughs> but we're looking at the Bible and look what it says. It says here in Revelation 13, 16, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive the mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. The mark of the beast isn't a day of the week. How anyone could come up with that, I've never understood. The mark of the beast is a specific thing in a specific place. And the Bible says it's in the right hand or the forehead. Period. <laughs> There's no, and it's a day of the week. No, it's in a specific place, either in the right hand or the forehead. That's what the Bible teaches. You either believe that or you don't. But the Bible says that it's a specific thing in a specific place, and it will be taken by those that accept the mark of the beast in their right hand or in their forehead. Now, this is your forehead right in here. Now, thinking about this throughout history, has there ever been a time in history when when a religion, I guess you could say, has ever had someone put something on themselves, on their right hand or on their forehead? Well, I was thinking along those lines, and I, and I remembered, you know, you know there's, there's this thing called Catholicism. Catholicism, what do they do? Well, in Catholicism, there's one time every year where you go to the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church on Ash Wednesday, they command you, to put ash right there. And they put a little spot, a little dot right there on your forehead. And I thought to myself, well, that's, <laughs> the Bible warns us about the mark of the beast. It's connected with the Antichrist. It's connected with the devil. Who would want to belong to a religion that says, oh, go ahead and put this little mark on your forehead every, every year on Ash Wednesday. So I thought about that. I thought, well, that, that's definitely going to be something that I don't do. <laughs> I want to be a, a man who follows the Bible and, you know, but that, that can't be the mark of the beast, can it? Well, you look at Catholicism, you find something quite interesting as well. The Pope has a hat. I don't know if you're familiar with the Pope's hat. But the Pope of Rome, he's a guy that, that wears this really funny looking hat. Maybe you've seen his hat. It's got all these little things around it like this. And the Pope has a, something that's on his hat. So the Pope has a hat. And on his hat, there's a, there's a saying. Here's your little Pope here. You know, he's like, hi, I'm the Pope. The Pope, on his hat, has these words. All right? This is what the Pope's hat says. Vicarious, it's in Latin. Vicarious Philly D. All right? This is actually on the forehead of the Pope when he puts on his papal Popal, papal, a hat. Now, if you look at these letters, now remember the Pope, while well, they speak Latin over there in Rome. So you take all these letters and you look at them in Roman numerals. Let's do just that. Let's take all these letters here and look at them. V I C A R 
I V S Philly F I L I I D. Let's go to what are called Roman numerals. Have you ever uh, done Roman numerals? You know, a V is a five, and an I is a one, and a, all these different things. Roman numerals, okay? X is ten. If we take this thing, this saying, Vicarius Philly D, which basically means the vicar of Christ, or in place of God, because that's what he claims to be, the Pope claims to be here on earth in, in the place of God, in God's place, that's what the Pope thinks he is. He's God's gift to man in the place of God. All right? He's here on earth in the place of God. He's supposed to be the, the head of the church. All right, you take these, these letters and you put a numer numerical value to them, which is nothing more than Roman numerals. And you come up with something quite surprising. C is 500, V is 5, A, that's nothing, R is nothing, there's an 1 there, uh, a V is number 5, and S is nothing in Roman numerals. But you look at all of these in Roman numerals, uh, uh, an L is 50, um, here's one, one, a, a D is 500, E, why well, that's nothing. I, you total all those up, and you would be surprised to see what that totals up that is written on the Pope's hat. The Pope wears a hat, and right across his forehead on that hat says these words, Vicarious Philly D. And you total those numbers up, if you look at those words as numbers rather than letters, and they come out to exactly 666. No, pure coincidence, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. All I know is I don't want to be a part of something like that. Uh, the Bible warns us about the mark of the beast and how it's something that's worn on a forehead. It warns us about the Antichrist and how he's somebody that comes along and he, he says blasphemies. He says things that aren't true. Like, hey, I'm God. You know, things like that. So I, I look at those things and I go, hmm, I'm, I'm going to kind of steer away from that. I'm not a Roman Catholic. I'm a Bible-believing Christian, King James Bible believer. People say, are you Protestant? No, I'm just a Bible believer. Um, sure, I, I would protest some of the things that they teach that, that don't line up with the Bible, but I don't go by that. I just go by I'm a Bible believer. I'm a King James Bible believer. I'm a blood-washed saint of God, saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, by grace through faith, saved. So I look at that, I say, well, there's Catholicism, and it's, and you start looking at, on their foreheads and on their hands, you start seeing some stuff. Well, then I said, well, what about any other religion? Is there any other kind of religion where something like this is, is, is shown? And sure enough, I found Islam. So Catholicism, we see this. And also in Islam, we see this. We go to Islam, and, and the Islamists, they, they like to wear this thing on their forehead. So they take this little bandana-looking thing, and they tie this around their forehead. And so when you look at this, you go, huh, this is kind of odd. On their forehead, a lot of Muslims, a lot of the ISIS people, they have this thing that they tie around their head, but it goes, and it has all this writing on it, and, and they've got all this really weird writing. And you know, there's all this writing on there, and you know, if you don't uh, speak their language, you look at all that writing and you go, that's, that's weird. Let me go ahead and put up a picture of that right now for you to see what I'm talking about, because I, I can't draw, draw out the Arabic. But you look at the writing, and you look at what they have, and you find something quite interesting. Let me go ahead and spell out 666 in Greek. 666 in Greek is this, all right? 666 in Greek, okay? This is how you say 600 in Greek. This is 60 in Greek. And this is 6 in Greek. So we know that when John was writing the book of Revelation, he was receiving visions from God. He was seeing visions from God. And he knew Greek. He actually wrote the book in Greek. And he knew that 666 in Greek would be these three letters. That they use letters for numbers, just like they did in Latin. Sometimes letters are numbers. So this would be 666 in Greek. So we look at this, and we find something quite interesting. We find that when we look at what ISIS and those kind of people wear on their forehead, and some of these Muslims that go around with this green bandana with all this Arabic writing, within that Arabic writing, we kind of find 
these same letters. And we go, huh. And we say, well, what, what is this? I mean, because it kind of looks like we're seeing in that 666. If John saw a vision in his day and he saw people wearing stuff on their forehead and he, and he said, they're 666, and he knew Greek and he saw all these symbols and they look like the Greek for 666, well, that would explain why he said, you know, these people have it on their forehead. So that's an interesting thing. So that, that's just historical. I mean, that's just, let's look historically at, is there any religion on earth that has ever put something on someone's forehead that just kind of has 666? <laughs> Catholicism and Islam. Because in Islam, they wear a bandana that has these different Arabic letters, and they kind of look like 666 in Greek. And you've got the Pope putting the hat on, 666 in Roman numerals. You've got them putting Ash Wednesday, the Ash on. So you've got to wonder about that. <laughs> uh, if I remember right, when they baptize a baby in Catholicism, don't they make a little sign of the cross on their forehead? So you look at this, and you kind of go, well, that, that just doesn't sound like that's Bible. That doesn't sound like somebody who claims to be a Christian should do. Uh, I even forgot to show you how to say Allah in Arabic. Now, I'm not very good at how to spell Allah, but in Arabic, the name Allah is kind of like this, and it, it kind of, I mean, that, that's just horrible. I'm not good at, at Arabic, but you, you look at it, and you go, that kind of looks like that. So even the name Allah himself, Allah, kind of looks like, 666. So you go, huh, well that's, man, no, nothing to see here, right? No, let's just, let's move on, there's nothing to see here. Or is there something to that? It's a good question. So, we see that the mark is, is something real, that is really on a hand or a forehead. Could it be something like that? Now, what else? The second thing I want to say about this mark and I'm going to get to later the right hand. I was just looking at the forehead just then. We'll look at the right hand later. But the second thing I want to say about this mark is it's connected to, to finances. It has to do with the financial thing. This mark is all tied into buying and selling. You cannot buy or sell without this mark. So it has something to do with the market. <laughs> it kind of sounds like the word mark, right? Market. <laughs> well, that's interesting. But... You can't buy or sell unless you have this mark. Back to Revelation 13, 17. Revelation 13, 17 says, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So you cannot buy anything or sell anything without having this mark. What an odd thing. Now, that ties this into the market, into finances, into money, into, into selling, into economics. And that reminded me of studying all these years. Years ago, I had a job at a grocery store. Yes, I worked at Piggly Wiggly. Now, if you're not from down south, you don't know what a Piggly Wiggly is. Piggly Wiggly is a big grocery store chain. Now, they're not as many as there used to be. A lot of them have closed down. Um, as a kid, we used to call it Hoggly Woggly. <laughs> but I used to work as Piggly Wiggly when I was a kid, stocking shelves. And uh, even while I was in Bible school, I had my own business where I'd mow yards most of the year. Summertime, but wintertime, I didn't have any work. I'd go work for three or four months at Piggly Wiggly. And I stocked the shelves. And on every one of these uh, shelves were all these, what they call the UPC code. Now, in the 1970s in America, they, they started what they called the UPC code, and they put a barcode. It's also called a barcode on all products. And it looks something like this. You've probably seen a barcode. They still use them today. Go to any supermarket and look, and you'll see what this is. It's a barcode on every product. And each one of these lines, sometimes two together, make a number. And, and the numbers come together, and I can't remember how many um, there are, but these, these lines are numbers. And that's how you identify the code of the product because all products are numbered. But you have three lines that are longer than all the other. One line by itself is the number three. Put two together, that's six. Every barcode has within it six, six, six. Now they invented that in the 1970s. 
and they put that out. And Christians have been looking at that and going, huh, that's interesting how that ties into the mark of the beast. You can't buy or sell the number 666. Every single product they sell at the grocery store has 666 printed right on the side. That's odd. <laughs> that's really weird. I remember as a kid in the 80s, they introduced these, these scanners. So you would go over to the um, grocery store, you would pick up one of these products that had a barcode like that on it, and you would go to the, um, to the checkout counter. And the checkout counter had this thing there that looked like this. And it was a hexagonal, hexagonal shape. It was called a hex scanner. And inside, all these lasers were pro projecting, and you put the, the product over this hex scanner, and it'd go, beep. What does that mean? It means the computer, through the laser, read the barcode, and then it put it in the computer, the price of that thing. So this here was called a hex scanner. Well, how, what is a hex? A six. <laughs> So even when you went, and I don't know if they look like this anymore, I think now when, when we go to Walmart, we see them, they're little handheld devices with the laser, and you just go beep, beep, or, or it's something in front of them, they just run it by. But they're always looking for that 666. Every single product, beep, 666, beep, 666, beep, 666, all the way through. And how interesting that it was a hex scanner. One, two, three, four, five, six. Huh, interesting. So... We're definitely in the last days that the devil has been working hard since the 70s, getting out his number. Because remember, the mark of the beast has three parts, a number, a mark, and a name. Well, he's got his number out there. He's, the entire financial industry runs on selling products with his number on it. That's pretty incredible. That's pretty scary if you think about it. Now, it's a financial thing, okay? So it's something that you have to have. After the rapture, they're going to make people take some sort of a mark. Now, some people have thought it'll be a barcode tattooed on your right hand or on your forehead. I don't think they'll force people to take tattoos because tattoos hurt. And putting all those little you know, needles and everything, injecting, that's kind of, that, that hurts. But they have what they call an RFID chip. Have you ever heard of an RFID? Radio Frequency ID chip. ID is identification. And they come out with these. I was going to bring a book out and show you that I had, but I was reading it earlier. I don't know where I put it. Called Spy Chips. If you get a chance, look up that book, Spy Chips. Everything is a chip now. You get a, you get a um, credit card. And in the credit card, they have a little chip. And there's your little chip. It's all about the chip. Well, there's what they have in this world. They have what they call RFID chips. Now, the Verichip company came out with these, and they called them human implantable RFID chips. They are injectable. They're about the size of a grain of rice. All right, now this one's bigger, so you can see it. And they have in them this, this copper wiring, and they're self-charging. But they need to be in a part of the body in which they can be charged by movement. So the people that put out these RFID chips that they want to inject, and by the way, there are people today taking these chips and injecting them in their hand. Uh, there are companies in America and all throughout the world that say you can't work in our company unless you take a chip. People go, okay, go ahead and inject the chip. Usually the chip is injected right there. So you take your hand and, and you kind of close your, your thumb close to this finger and you see that little fat right there that kind of pops up. I don't know if you can see that. They usually inject right there into that area and they put a chip. Now, I think I have a picture of that I'll put up here for you to see. They're already doing that as I speak. There are companies that are having people. Now, there's some people that put it on here in the arm, some people that have injected it in other places. But the company that put this out says we need movement. We need movement. And most people are right-handed, and most people use their right hand. So as they move their hand, it recharges the chip. But it's an ID chip, and they can put information on that, like a bank card or a bank account number. And so you can literally inject the chip here. That's your bank. And everywhere you go, you just go to that scanner and put your hand across. Beep. And you buy and sell. You see, everything's in place for the mark of the beast if it's going to be that chip. 
And uh, that's what it, a lot of people have been thinking lately in the last, you know, five, ten years when this thing came out. They're like, uh, we think maybe even 15 years. Uh, we really think this could be the mark of the beast. It's going to be something that is injected into someone. Now, they also, nowadays, they've, they're replacing the barcode with what they call the Q, I want to say it right, the QR, the quick response. So we have this other thing called the QR, the quick response. And it looks like this. No doubt, if you've got a cell phone, you've probably seen it. And uh, I don't know if I have a picture of it. I'm afraid if I put a picture up that, that you'll buy something. <laughs> because what they do is they give you these cell phones, and you just take a picture of that with your cell phone, and that took the place of the barcode, and then you say, I want this, and automatically your smartphone looks it up and says, well, that's this product here. And what these QRs look like is they look like this. They have four boxes on the outside, and they have all these little dots inside of it. Kind of like a leopard. <laughs> and some are thicker than others. And, and every one is its own little unique picture. And each one represents. So they did away with the numbers and they just do images. Huh. Did I just say image? I guess I did. <laughs> uh, you know, the Bible says, watch out for the image of the beast. Hmm. Interesting. So now they're using images. And some people think that this might be the mark of the beast, that they just put some sort of implantable image inside of you. I don't know. I looked up the word mark in Greek, and it's karagma. It means to scratch or etch. A stamp. It, it, is it a, it's a stamp as a badge of servitude or sculpture, a figure, a graven mark, a statue. So when you look at this, you say, wow, <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, go to Revelation 13, 15. Revelation 13, 15, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So there's some sort of image that goes along with the beast. And you must worship that image. Somehow it might be tied into the mark. Now, if the mark is some sort of injectable microchip or something like that, which kind of sounds like it could very well be, it says it's in your right hand or in your forehead. And a lot of people say, well, why would somebody want it in their forehead? Well, that, that little spot right there keeps warm. You know, you're always going where somewhere, you're always doing something, blood is always flowing to your head. So it, it, it needs to be kept warm and it needs to be in motion. So here or here is, is the place that they determined would be the best place to put an implantable microchip in order for it to continually recharge. Isn't it weird how technology is keeping up with the Bible? <laughs> God said 2,000 years ago, now this is what's going to be like the last day, so get ready, buckle up, and now we're seeing in our day, wow, everything seems to be here. The number's already there. The mark, if that is the mark of the beast. It, it, the, the word in Greek means a scratch, you know. If you get a scratch, it, it does something, it, it, it opens your skin usually to scratch it. So I think it has to be something that's implantable, this mark of the beast, something that goes inside. So I would say it's probably this RFID chip, and that would be the thing that people... But you never know. It could be something else. It could be just an image or something that's put on you that stays there. But whatever it is, it's going to cause some problems. Now, I don't wish anyone to miss the rapture. I'm a Bible preacher. I believe in the gospel. So I want you to get saved today so you go at the rapture. I don't want you to miss the rapture so you have to be in this time period of the Antichrist where you have to take the mark of the beast. Because the Bible says if you take the mark of the beast, whatever it may be, an implantable microchip or whatever it is, it's going to make you sick. Go to Revelation 16. It will give you an infection. Revelation chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, look at what the Bible says about those people that take the mark of the beast. Again, if you miss the rapture, and you're living in this time, and they say you have to take the mark of the beast, if you take it, this is what's going to happen. Revelation chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Verse 2, And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and on them which worshipped his image. Whoever takes the mark of the beast, they're going to get a grievous sore. They're going to get sick. 
that mark of the beast, there's something about it that it does not mix with your body. And your body says, no, I don't want that thing inside of me. Now, the people that invented this years ago, oh, probably 25, 30 years ago, while I was in Bible school, I remember hearing the audio tape of this, and I've not found it ever since, but I remember the man, uh, I wish I remembered his name, he came out and he said, I was part of the laboratory that that came about inventing these RFID chips and, and how we decided to inject things like this into people's right hands. And he said, we use lithium. So we use some kind of a lithium. And, and someone said, well, if you put that in the human body, lithium's not very good for you, you know? So what, what are you thinking to use lithium? And what happens if you put one of these chips and, and, and somehow it breaks or something? Well, the lithium would, would, would get into the body and leach out into the body and make you sick. And he said, and it would make a black sore. <laughs> oh, so just like the Bible says, huh? <laughs> you can't get away from God and the Word of God and the Bible. It's just incredible. So I don't know. Again, I'm not saying the mark of the beast has to be in this chip or whatever. I'm just saying that that's the understanding of many Christians today. Looking at this from this side, we're not over there. And we're thinking, man, it's got to be something like that. It's got to be something that they put in your body. And God gets so angry with you choosing that, that he says, okay, you're just going to have an infection. You're just going to have a sore. I'm going to make sure that you're sick. Now, we also look at this thing, and we ask the question, what is the final end of those who take the mark of the beast? If a person takes the mark of the beast, can they be saved? You see, we today in the church age, we're saved by trusting in the blood atonement of Christ. When we trust in what Jesus did, because he died for us, that's when we're saved. And we go up at the rapture, so we're not going to be here to take the mark of the beast, we who are saved in the church age. But what if somebody's left behind and they're like, well, you know, I want to buy and sell, otherwise I can't eat, so, all right, give me the mark. What happens to them? Well, not only do they get sick physically, but go to Revelation chapter 19. They go to hell when Jesus comes back at the battle of Armageddon. And when Jesus returns at Armageddon, he said he would. Anybody that has the mark of the beast, it's over for them. They're going to go directly to hell. They're not going to pass go. They're not going to collect 200. There's no forgiveness by God to anyone who chose the mark of the beast. Because the mark of the beast is tied in to Lucifer, which is Satan. So anyone who takes the mark of the beast, they're worshiping the beast. They're worshiping Lucifer. They're Satan worshipers. And God says, I will not give you salvation to come into my millennial kingdom if you take that mark. We find that in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20. And the beast was taken with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshiped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Those that take a mark of the beast will go with the beast into the lake of fire. Now go to Revelation 14, 9 through 11. Again, we're told. Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or his right hand. Verse 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Verse 11, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. They go to the lake of fire. They go to flames. They go to torment because they took the mark of the beast. So folks, this isn't something to take lightly, the mark of the beast. This is uh, important to know. Your immortal soul depends on whether or not you take that mark if you don't go at the rapture. And if you do, your soul is damned to hell. If you don't, that's the only way you can be saved in the tribulation period. But what happens if you don't take the mark of the beast? If you want to be free of the beast, if you want to be free from this mark, if you want to say, no, I don't, I don't want the mark of the beast, then what should you do? Well, here's what you should do. Well, I got my things messed up up here. I'm going to go ahead and change that for you real quick. Sorry about that.
Okay, sorry about that. I, I skipped one, so I went ahead and erased the, the ones that I put down and put it back in. The Mark of the Beast is, has to do with that image. It's a figure and something to do with some image. All right, so then I went back and number four would be the infection of the sword. Number five, the final end of the flames. Now, number six, the sixth thing I want to say about the Mark of the Beast is freedom. If you miss the rapture and you say, oh, man, I didn't go with the rapture. I wasn't saved. What should I do? And you are in this tribulation period. Here's what you should do. You need to come to Jesus. You need to say, Jesus, I take you. I want you. And I don't want the Antichrist. And when the Antichrist comes along and he says, now take the mark of the beast, you have to say no. When you say no, the Bible says that you will be beheaded. Go to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Revelation 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, nor his image. Okay? They didn't have the mark of the beast. They didn't take his figure or his image or whatever it was. They, they just said no. Neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So where were these people? At the altar in heaven. And there are souls here that were beheaded, and they are up in heaven. Because during the tribulation, they said to the Antichrist, we will not take your mark. Now, the Antichrist will be a dictator. The Antichrist won't go, oh, well, that's okay. He's going to say, you take my mark, or I chop your head off. So if you want to be saved and have freedom from the Antichrist and this horrible, wicked mark that will not only damn your soul to hell but will give you a horrible infection, you have to say no. And saying no to the Antichrist means you'll either have to flee for your life and live without food, which would be hard to do but not being able to buy or sell, or you'll have to say, look, let me just be a witness for Jesus. Just Antichrist, just go ahead and behead me right now. Just go ahead and kill me. Because there's going to be a capital punishment mandate in that time. Capital punishment for those that don't take the mark of the beast. So that's the devil. He is so horrible. He's so wicked. He wants you to worship him, and he hates you so much that he knows that if you do take his mark, that you're going to get so sick. You're going to get so sick. And he knows you'll be damned to hell, but he doesn't care. And he'll be laughing at you the whole time. So you got to think about those things. If you miss the rapture and you're in the tribulation, is it worth it? To have, oh, three, four, five, six, seven years, possibly, of comfort and all eternity in a lake of fire. Is it worth it? Who is this Antichrist? Well, we've looked at the Antichrist uh, a little bit, the, the mark of the beast. We really, we've, we went into the mark more than anything. So I talked about the mark. I want to talk about now the beast. Who is this beast? You see, we have the number. We know what the number is. We already see in the financial district the number being used in barcodes. We already know what the mark is. It's got something to do with something like this, either an image that's, that's put onto somebody or injected into them. But who is the Antichrist? What's his name? What is he all about? Well, let's go and look at Revelation chapter 17. I think it, it plays into the United Nations, and I believe that the United Nations will very much be a part of this. If the United Nations will eventually take over the entire world, there will be no more borders, there will be no more nations. There will be one government over the whole world. We call that the New World Order, or the One World Government. And that's the plan of Satan. That's what the devil wants, a One World Order. But in Revelation chapter 17, verses 8 through 11, we see what the Bible talks about this beast being. And he's a king. So what is this beast? He's a future leader. So he's a future king. So you look at this future leader who's coming, and I don't know when he's coming or who he is, but whoever he is, he looks like he's going to be the head of the United Nations. They're going to crown him as the king of the world. Now, you go to Revelation 17, and it talks about this. Revelation 17, 8 through 11. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and shall go into perdition. And that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. 
And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast which was and is not, even he is the eighth that is of, of the seven, and goeth unto perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but with few power as kings one hour with the beast. And these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So I, read, I went ahead and read down verse 13. But the Bible tells us that this beast, this coming Antichrist, will be the head over the entire world. Now, I've thought about this long and hard, and uh, there's a lot of YouTube videos on this. But I've already showed you that the method that the Antichrist uses for killing people who refuse the mark is beheading. He's going to behead people. You know, in the old days, the French, they used what they called the guillotine. Have you ever seen a guillotine? It's a pretty scary thing, a guillotine. A guillotine is a thing that uh, you put your head in here. It has this huge blade up here on it and a rope. And the guy's down here holding the rope, and he lets go of the rope, and that huge blade falls down and chops the guy's head off. And down here is his head in a bucket full of blood. That's one way to head people with a guillotine, and all the blood pours out. And the Antichrist, he's going to behead people, but there's also another way to behead people, and that's with a sword. And there's one religion, and I, I hate to even call it a religion because it's not really a religion, it's more of a political uh, ideal or a political regime. There's only one governmental system in the world that kills people by beheading. You know who that is? Islam. So we're reading here in the Bible in Revelation chapter 17 about these seven kings. They're like seven mountains. And somebody sent me this, and I, I don't know how much of this I agree with, but I thought I'd end with this. I thought this was kind of interesting to give you an idea. Could it be that Islam is the one in the end in which the Antichrist comes from? And the reason the Bible says those that don't take the mark, it's because they're beheaded. It's because Islam is in control of the entire world, and they're the ones with the sword beheading people. In the Bible, we're given all these different kingdoms. And the Bible tells us the names of all these different kingdoms. And it's interesting that there's all these nations in the world that ever, have ever been really big nations. And, and what's funny is they're all over in the Middle East. You know, God never mentions um, United States of America or someplace like that. God's dealing with his people, the Jews, Israel over in that area, in that nation. So, the first people we see in the Bible are Egypt. And God calls out of Egypt his people, Israel. So we see Israel called out of Egypt. And if you want to study the Bible and understand, it's about God's chosen people, Israel. So Egypt were called out. The next big country to take over was Assyria. After Assyria came Babylon. These are all, and you can go to the book of Daniel and read the book of Daniel, and it talks about all these different nations. Well, Israel went into captivity into Babylon because they rebelled against God. The next big uh, country to take over was Media Persia. All right, the next one to show up was Greece. Grecian. Um, empire. And Israel is living and doing their thing. And then comes Rome. No, I have to take that out. And then comes Rome, and what happens? Israel goes into captivity again. So, the Bible is a book written by Jews, all about the Jews, and how they live throughout time with all these other governing nations. Well, the Jews were in captivity, and then up shows Jesus Christ, right there. And the Jews reject their Messiah, and so all the Jews are dispersed throughout the world for almost 2,000 years. And what you have is here the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire rules for close to 400 years. And again, this is all about the Middle East, all that over there where God's people were, Israel. That's the place that God's looking at. The Bible doesn't mention in America and places like that. It's all God dealing with his people, the Jews, throughout history with all these different nations. 
The Ottoman Empire ended in 1917 when the British came in and defeated the Ottoman Empire, and then they made the Balfour Declaration, and they told the Jews, hey Jews, guess what, you can come back. So the Jews are back, and in 1947 they moved back, and in 48 they became a nation. So we're looking at God and prophecy and God's calendar, and we're saying, wow, look at that. And we just read that there were seven kings, and they're like mountains. And we look at the seven different main um, governing bodies over the whole history of the world, and there just happens to be seven of them. And then the eighth one, that's when the beast shows up. And we look at the Bible, we look at the time period, we're like, oh, God's back to Israel. So this must be really close. 2018 was celebration of 70 years for Israel, and God put them in captivity back to Israel, all that stuff. But it looks like to me, when you look at these different nations, there's Muslims, Islam. Islam took over all these nations. Islam took over Egypt and Assyria and Babylon and Media Persia and Greece. They're taking over Italy and the Europe now with the European invasion. So you've got to look at this and you've got to go, wow. Now, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4, what does it say? Beheading. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus Christ. So those that don't take the mark of the beast are beheaded. Who does beheadings? Islam. Islam is the only one in the world that beheads people. So this eighth person is the beast. And Islam is the biggest religion in the world today. So could it be that Islam is what's in charge when the mark of the beast comes? And that's why when people don't take the mark of the beast, that's why they're beheaded, because Islam beheads those that they deem as infidels. There's a huge guy whose name is Ergodon. Ergodon. Ergodon is trying to revive the Ottoman Empire. He calls it his caliphate. He's trying to raise again the Islamic caliphate. He might do it. I don't know. I'm not saying that Ergodon is the Antichrist. I'm not saying that at all. It's, it's, it's interesting that you go to the letters of his name and you can get the word dragon out of it. <laughs> I find that quite interesting. But... It is interesting, and I'll just throw this out here, that we read about the mark of the beast in the Bible. It's a forehead thing. Well, you look at that, there's 666 on their forehead. Or it's a right hand thing. It's future. We know it's not before the rapture. But those who do not take that mark get their heads cut off. Well, I look at history, the only people run around lopping off people's heads in the name of their religion, in the name of their God, by the way, their God's name is Allah, and his name, the way it's spelled, kind of looks like this in Greek. <laughs> Go to World Net Daily and look up um, Allah, God of Violence, 1700 B.C. That's WND.com, WorldNetDaily.com. In the name of the article, you type it into the search engine, it's, it's Allah, 1700 B.C., God of Violence. And you see who, Gala, who you think Allah is. It makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. So I'm throwing that out there, and I'm saying that uh, what it looks like to me, according to the Bible, is that in the future, after the rapture, Islam takes over the world. And whoever this future Antichrist king beast is, and I don't know, some people have told me that the name Ergodon means the beast. I looked for that. I couldn't find that. That's something they said, but I, I couldn't confirm that. On the Internet, I found that it means falcon or a brave man. So I'm not sure about that. But there are people out there that are saying Ergodon is the beast. He's the Antichrist. Well, it's possible. If he ever, in time of history, tells somebody, you got to take my mark, well, then you have the name. But it could be someone else. It could be anybody. You know, is it, in Islam, there's this, there's this prophecy of this out of the East coming some guy that unites everybody. And when Obama became president, why, many Muslims said, that's him, that's him, that's him. So who knows? I have no idea. But I do know this, it is quite interesting that the Bible has all the answers. It tells us, you know, there's seven different this and seven that and the eighth one and the B. And you start to look at it and you kind of lay it out and you kind of go, hmm. And you got to scratch your head and say, it sure looks like a future Islamic caliphate taking over the entire world, chopping off the heads of people who do not take that mark of the beast. Now, I would be amiss to close this without telling you how to be saved today. If you are still here before the rapture comes, 
This is how you get saved. The Bible says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Go read that sometime. Tells you that you're saved by believing that Christ died for your sins and was buried and rose again. How did he do it? He shed his blood. The Bible says you trust the blood, Romans 3.25. It's about the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus loved us enough. He died for our sins. And he says we're saved by faith, by trusting him, going to him. You know, Lord, I accept you. I trust what you've done. I accept your payment for my sins. I, by faith, receive you as my Savior. Then you'll be saved. Then you can go at the rapture. It's all about faith. But if you're left behind and you're in this tribulation period, the best thing you can do is get your head chopped off. Just lay it down. Just say, hey, I believe in Jesus. Go ahead and take my head. Because I will not take that mark. I will not get a grievous sore. I will not end up in the flames of hell. So I hope this has been a blessing. I hope this has been a help to you. Um, I'm not trying to scare anyone. I just want you to see what the Bible says is true. We're seeing all this come to pass in our lifetime. And uh, if you're left behind at the rapture, you're going to see a lot more. But be forewarned, God says do not take the mark of the beast. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. God bless.